before I introduce Ty Ruby Nollingson, I would like to say that KVC is proud to sponsor this free event uh, with funding from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. And also, uh, if you want to learn more about future events from KVSC, uh, please stop by kvsc.org or visit us at facebook.com slash kvsc881fm. Also, we're going to have a questionnaires uh, on the back table when this is over. If you can fill that out and give us your input, and then also you can sign up for our e-newsletter. So, Ty Ruben Nollingson, uh, he has deep connections to St. Cloud State University. His father was a, a teacher here and he actually graduated from St. Cloud State. So, <laughs> Ty Rubin now is a lead conceptual designer uh, in Hollywood, and he's, he has upcoming films with Battle Los Angeles. That's gonna be a huge box office hit, I'm sure. We hope so. We hope. <laughs> it's, I've seen the previews, <laughs> it looks pretty cool. Uh, also, aliens. Priest, I don't know as much about that one, but that's coming up pretty soon it, too. Yeah, Battle LA is scary aliens, uh, Priest, scary vampires. All right. <laughs> So scary stuff, <laughs> all right? So with that, oh, also, he actually took time out of his day to uh, uh, go into the classroom and actually do some guest lecturing and help out with students and kind of tell his story there, too. So we appreciate that. And without further ado, I present Ty Rubin Ellison. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm assuming that everyone can hear. I always have to be concerned about people hearing because I've been at some lectures and talks where I couldn't hear, and it turns into kind of a, a nightmarish, uh, like cyclical, horrifying dream. Uh, and I don't want to have anybody have that experience because you have to deal with the cold. And, uh, you know, that's horrifying and cyclical enough. Uh, so um, I'd like to thank KVSC for inviting me and the university for hosting me. This is the third time I've been on this stage. Um, and it's interesting because I, I wish I had the ability to like edit together the last three talks, the first one being right after Jurassic Park in 1993, uh, and then I think in 97, and now here I am again. Because I think my perspective um, has shifted uh, over the years. But it took like 15 years to actually change enough for me to recognize it. So I'm hoping that I can infuse this talk tonight a little bit with uh, some of my newer thoughts about getting from the basement of my parents' house to, to working with uh, some, of the, some of the big directors in Hollywood. Um, and so I've, uh, what I've done is I've kind of pulled together slides from several different shows that I normally do in hopes that it will spark my imagination enough to share something of value. Uh, you know, I got to thinking about um, uh, talking about uh, this journey, and it occurred to me that normally when I do a talk, I'm talking to a very specific group of people that have a very specific interest. Normally it's kids who want to work in the movie business and they have portfolios and they want to say, gee, how can I have your career? Uh, another group might be people that um, are in a university setting as students that just are interested in creativity, so I talk about creativity. But knowing this was open to the public and I had assumed that the, the range of people in attendance would be people who may have known me, people who've been around St. Cloud and just kind of find it interesting that somebody, you know, works in Hollywood who kind of grew up uh, next to the Mississippi River, uh, freezing, and, uh, and then somebody who, um, you know, uh, actually uh, had these connections to St. Cloud State and used, used you know, the university in, a, in, a, in, I guess, the most appropriate way as, a, as the beginnings of a long curricular vita. You know, my resume starts with St. Cloud State. Um, and then what about me as a person? Like, how, how did I change or what did I think about during this evolutionary track? So I have more slides than I can possibly get through and I probably have more ideas than I can possibly share, but uh, I thought I would just run it for an hour and then uh, hopefully there'll be a piece or two that you might think about tomorrow with coffee because you'll be cold. And, uh, and then maybe, and I told myself I wasn't going to make any jokes about cold. I, was like, I actually said, don't make jokes because they just eat that up there. People in Minnesota love to hear about how tough they are to live in this crazy cold. It's like, God, you've got to be crazy to live here. Yeah, that's us, man. We're hot under that shit, you know. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, so, that's kind of what I hope to do, and um, I, I kind of made it a little bit free style for myself to keep myself nimble and on my toes, because it would be easy to talk, 
in a more technical way, and I'm not that uh, interested in that at this moment in my life. Uh, I start all of my lectures with this slide. This is uh, me in 1992 with Dr. Timothy Leary on the, on the right there. It would be your left. Um, I was able to spend an evening with Dr. Leary uh, because he had been doing a lecture at Industrial Light and Magic where I was working. Industrial Light and Magic is George Lucas's visual effects company, and it actually was started in, when he created Star Wars. Um, so I, I got my job there in 1988 and, and was just kind of about a year. It was in the fall, so I've been there a couple of years on this particular evening, and I, I didn't really know much about Leary other than he was in that Moody Blues song, you know, Timothy Leary's dead, and he had a lot to do with drugs, and he wanted to tune in and drop out, and I never had a lot of interest in the whole psychedelic angle, but I figured, you know, this would be a guy that would be kind of historically of relevance, and I might as well spend a little bit of time with him if I could. You can still smoke there, because that's the San Francisco airport, and he was a smoker. I find that interesting, because that was a long time ago. But um, one of the things that he told me, he was like 73, and he did this talk about the importance of embracing technology, and the importance of the common person taking an interest in technology. And um, this was right when the internet was just kind of getting going, and um, we were just doing the digital work at ILM. I mean, they had done some, some interesting things. And he, I, I talked to him about it, and I said, well, why do you hustle around doing these lectures? And he said, you know, I learn more about myself in those lectures than anything that I can present the audience who attends the lectures. He said that I try hard to give the audience something to, to find value in and find quality in, but it's me who really walks away with the, the quality of having had the opportunity to present myself publicly and to visit my thoughts in the context of these, these kinds of presentations, and it stuck with me, and, I, and I've actually tried to embrace a similar, uh, similar mindset that I really feel privileged to talk when I get to, and I do, I try to avoid cursing too much, but I really do try to, you know, think in terms of, of the commonality of the experiences that I've had and the commonality of the experiences that people have when looking at the work that I've done or looking at the films I've been a part of, and how does that kind of make sense in the terms of how does one motivate themselves, and how does one think about the future, and how does one think about creativity, and how does one kind of keep their youthful interest in life alive, which is sort of a theme of mine. Um, from here, I, I have to talk about my influences. Um, the biggest influence in my life, of course, was my father, and I found this awesome photo from when he was at the, um, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and you couldn't have a more like iconic image of the artist, right? You know, black and white, he's got his brushes, he's got the cigarette going, he's got his oil paints going. And, in, and even though my dad kind of quit smoking when I was born, uh, I have this kind of image of him as this kind of dynamic personality that was really never uh, shy about his, his personal vision of himself, you know? He was an artist and he was a working artist and he was gonna stay that and, and keep that alive and keep that as a big part of his life. So if you would have talked to me about my youth, I say, 20 years ago, I would have said, yeah, my dad had a great studio and he had lots of great materials and I could get access to paper and pencils and I could do work down there and it was really convenient for me and it really provided me an incubator for growth and, and, and to develop as an artist. But what's interesting, I think what I, what I was, it wasn't just the space and it wasn't just the awareness of his art form, but it was actually this seeing somebody who was passionately working day, and, day after day in the studio and it wasn't shy, like I said, about really saying, um, you know, you can do these things. You can make these things. You can create from scratch. You can color outside the lines. You can, you know, you can get away from the paint by numbers. You can get away from the model kits that have all the instructions. You know, you can, you can make these things for yourself. And if you're confident in them and you enjoy them, then other people are going to be able to do the same. So rather than thinking of the environment he created for me as a child and rather than thinking of those kinds of things, I see more that his guidance uh, and the guidance of other people that were important to me in my youth, other creative people, um, is really something that I appreciate more now at the age that I'm at than, um, than I possibly would have thought I would have in my 30s and my early 40s. So any students that are out there who are interested in my career path, I would say right off the bat, before we go any further, take stock in the people you know. Take stock in the people you admire. Really get in and try to understand what they're about, who they are, and why they're motivated to work, why they're motivated to create. Because those things are kind of, tr you know, they're kind of transcendent. They kind of move on. And uh, I think that 
sometimes we, we undervalue the personalities we're in, you know, that we're surrounded by. I had to share this tonight because I, I become a big fan of Facebook. I never thought I would. I, uh, I, I really resisted it. Um, I didn't think it was something for me. I thought it was a lot of like yesterday I had a sandwich and this morning it's really cold. I live in Minnesota, I'm freezing. Um, lots of things that had to do with the dog's cute, here's 50 photos of it. Um, wow, I've never seen a cat before, so let me put thousands of photos of cats on my web page. Lots of links to articles that I've seen, you know, and any kind of trick of the eyes, like, you know, look at bad jokes, they're always there. And so I was really like, ah, I don't think it's for me, and I don't really dig it that much. But what's happened is these things, the, these technological uh, developments, have actually started to find their place in my life, and they're no longer as novelty items to, to me. You can, you can generate lots of garbage by using Facebook, and you can burn off a lot of time, but if you start to use the tool with a little bit of fidelity, if you start to use that, that media of, uh, of the internet connection to the world, think of yourself as a little radio station and a little receiver, and kind of put quality stuff up and then keep it kind of quality, I think, it's, I think it actually is a really, uh, a, a really interesting um, uh, uh, universe that's starting to develop. It's starting to coalesce and make sense. I, that, this doesn't really have that much to do with how I got from my parents' basement to the stage, but the story goes like this. I was doing some work uh, over the last few weeks on a couple of projects, and I was really, really focused on trying to get finished so when I came to Minnesota, I would not have unfinished business at home. Um, I was working, and of course, as I always do, I was pushing my own deadlines further into the future. And I actually was hoping to do this presentation and put my slides together uh, starting on last Friday, but what ended up happening is, of course, I was gonna work into the weekend because I, I got behind, and that's how that all works. But I was thinking, I woke up Sunday morning with one day to go before I had to get on a plane and fly up here, and I was thinking about this photograph, the, the last one of my father, and I was gonna use that photo. And so I got up that morning and had a cup of coffee and was tracking through some old scans and found this photo. And right about that time on my Facebook account, Bill Skoji, who was a student of my father's, who I knew when I was here at St. Cloud State, sent me this link and it said, I saw your father this morning. And it was a link to this picture, which I have no idea what it is, but that's my father in 1959. That was the year I was born. Uh, these are two poet laureates. This was taken at the Minneapolis School of Art, and I never would have seen this photo if it wasn't for Facebook. I certainly don't know where this photo came from. I, now I can research it a little bit and, and look into it, but the serendipity timing, you know, like the timing of here I am here coming back to St. Cloud, looking at this stuff, thinking about my father, boom, this shows up. It's, it's spooky. It spooked me out. I had to like drink a lot of extra coffee that morning because I was <laughs> spooked out by it. So, excuse me. So, as a sideline uh, idea, if you're not on Facebook, I would suggest you might want to, to look into it. Um, beyond my father, probably the biggest influence of my entire life as far as artwork goes and artists goes was Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was out in 1968. I was at the perfect age, I imagine, to see the movie because um, my brain was still forming and I still looked at adults as having all the answers, you know, which I didn't, I didn't hold on to that idea really long. But um, at that particular time at eight, I still or eight or nine, I thought that they had all the answers. And this movie, um, unlike, uh, unlike uh, so many of the pictures today, really allowed for the viewer to participate in the meaning of the film. Um, I think Kubrick created a, 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 like an enigmatic uh, tableau, like, almost like a Rorschach test, which compelled the viewer to come up with their own interpretation. And you can say that it meant this and it meant that, and you can look at the monolith as an icon that might represent God and so on and so forth. But really, it, it, it does allow for the viewer to go to the source material and actually put their own creative thoughts into the, into the presentation and, and into being an audience. Um, I just cannot escape the potency of these simple images because they're about a period in man's existence where you know, the human condition was, was just primitive, and then the, during the course of the movie, it advances. And in a weird way, I'm, I mean, that's the story of everyone's life. You know, you start out as being kind of, I love this, because I really thought my future was gonna look just like this. Like, I thought 2001, it's not that far. I'm gonna go to the orbiting space station and get one of those red chairs. And I could see they still had Hilton, you know, they had nice same restaurants, but, uh, or the hotel. 
But I think that, that every time I get uh, too far down in thinking about myself, like who's Ty Ellingson and how did I get here, I have to go right back to this stuff. And um, if you look at the themes of the movie, you've got pretty much what my whole career is. You've got Hal, which is a robot, you know, it's a computer. And then you've got, uh, you know, you've got space, spacesuits, spaceships. And then you've got this kind of notion of the unknown and the mysteries of the universe. And, and that stuff excites me. And I can tell you without a doubt, I love this because this is modern man doing what the ape man did, of course. Um, I'm still as excited by these concepts as I was when I was nine years old. So the next question is, if you're a student and you're interested in a career path like mine, I would suggest that a good thing to meditate on is, like, how does one keep their passion? Uh-oh. Did I just lose my microphone? No. How does one keep their passions alive through the course of 50-odd years? And I kind of call it dream management. And I think that what it, what it boils down to me is, is that you have to evaluate yourself on a regular basis. Try to, try to take time to look at where your interests lie and why do they lie there and, and what excites you about it. Sometimes people think, well, if you think too much about certain kinds of mysterious things, like, well, I love the Beatles, but I really don't want to know too much about music because I might wreck it. Well, you probably are going to grow as a person and these things are going to need to shift and change anyway. So you might as well take an active part in it. And I remember at a young age, and I don't know how this started to happen for me, but what I used to do was I used to play this seven-year game and I used to think to myself, if I met myself in seven years, would I be impressed with that person? And I didn't mean impressed just because I thought he'd have a cool car and he might be kind of dating hot chicks and interesting and all that and not living in Minnesota. I really thought of it as something where I would be like, imp like devastatingly impressed. Like somebody would like say, geez, this guy's, he's really on a track. And I think that process, and I, like I, when I started to do it, I, I actually started to focus on a loop of myself. Who am I now and who do I want to be? And who do am I now and where do I want to be? And how would I get there? And the, the, that looping process and this kind of dream management, I think is, if I had to boil it all away, it wasn't, it, you know, it was that piece that really has driven me for all these years and has provided me the resources intellectually and creatively and emotionally to just keep pushing ahead. Because when I start to kind of have failure today, I think about the failure of the future and looking at myself and saying, well, you know, you could have been more happy because you were doing these things and they were awesome, or, you know, maybe you should have been making more dynamic moves or thinking more dynamic thoughts or whatever. So, you know, when I get asked now about how do I get into the business, rather than saying, well, you should buy a computer and learn Photoshop and these various things, um, I start to say, well, look, take stock in yourself. Now, what does that mean? Just like I described, be very serious about it. Have a methodology about it. You know, take your dreams as serious as a heart attack. Because if you don't, no one will. It's absolutely true. The universe will not care if you don't get to work in the movies. It won't. So take ownership and say, well, then, damn it, I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to have to find a way to make these things happen for me, and I'm going to be as creative as possible in looking for these opportunities. Space Odyssey, of course, is about this evolution from primitive man to space and then ultimately to the next generation or the next evolution of humanity. Now, I feel a little bit awkward in that I don't know what was going on exactly in the 60s and 70s as far as the larger landscape of culture goes. Um, my earliest memories and my main memories of the period was that the space program was just in full swing. Uh, and it was real. And you could see that we were going to the moon. And you could see the moon in the sky. And the idea that you were going to actually witness man who had been in boats and trains and made some planes go in a little tiny capsule to the moon was devastatingly impressive to me. It, it just affected me on such a fundamental level that today I have to say I feel a little bit kind of sad uh, in a genuine way that the culture that we live in doesn't seem to have this kind of dream goal that really pushes the imagination forward. Now, of course, there's a lot of things that happen. You know, I mean, there's a lot of the Vietnam War was going on. There was a lot of, like, you know, civil rights issues. There was women's rights issues. There were lots of things going on that would, could be categorized as, you know, necessarily, uh, not necessarily positive. There was need for change. But having man space flight at the front of the end, at the train engine front, you know, was something that, that I feel was really important to 
you know, maintaining a super, uh, uh, you know, positive, optimistic view of what my life was going to turn into. And of course, as much as I just said Facebook is awesome, I think sometimes the saturation of news is, is, is it's got to have an erosive quality on youth. It's just so much information that you can't process in a positive way. I mean, you hear about a typhoon or a, a tidal wave, you know, you just can't turn it off. You know, you have to go, that's awful. And then you think of yourself floating in water and, you know, and, and it, it makes you feel sad for people you'll never meet and don't know. And it's unfortunate as all get out and it's super, uh, you know, it's super heinous. But I think that there was a kind of naivety that was a, around when I was young and it was easy to shut off the TV and go out to the lakeside and not think these thoughts. So the other thing is I would say, and I don't know how to say this properly, is like be optimistic and positive uh, and look for opportunities to celebrate those things. You know, look for opportunities to share uh, with the things that work great, like Facebook, you know, join it. I, I think you should join Facebook. Join Facebook when you get home. Um, of course, 2001 A Space Odyssey has Hal, who's the maniacal computer that goes insane and, you know, turns off the life support for all the crew and kills everybody. And so there was this component at work also, which is the, the reality of man dealing with machines. And if there's one other thing about my career is I've been at the forefront of what computer technology has become. I mean, working with computers and seeing that evolution is frightening. It's frightening because it takes a little bit of wind out of the sail on each step that it improves. It takes somebody else's wind a little bit. Like if you were a musician back in the day and you played the flute and then, you know, that's super awesome and you work super hard and you're all into the flute and then they make a little, you know, MIDI se sequencer then it can play kind of flute sounds and, you know, your, your hard work makes you go down a notch. They go, ah, oh, we don't need a flute. Let's just bring in the Moog synthesizer and do 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 you know. And of course that's true with the arts as well. But I always think that there's something more to be done on the personal level to compensate for these technological leaps. So I put the scary Hal picture in there just because a lot of people are scared about, uh, you, know, um, you know, can I work in Photoshop and wow, it's complicated, these programs, and are they going to take away jobs from people? Well, yeah, they are. They're going to take jobs away and they're going to make people's lives miserable when they're not aware of how to run them or what to do with them and so forth. But that's part of the curve, you know, that's, that's what you have to uh, just put into your matrix. Well, I, you know, seven years from now, I'll be working with these things in a positive way and I'll understand them and I'll embrace them in a manner that allows me to, uh, you know, to thrive. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to move more quickly into the actual work that I've been doing for the last 20 years, but uh, I included this because it's a little bit of a touchstone piece for me as well, is that, um, what is it about my design sense that makes me unique in an industry that's filled with talented people? Um, and I think that it has to do with the, the kind of work that my father did as a printmaker. Uh, he was a, a, a woodcut printer, you know, did woodcut block printing when I was a kid, he did lithography, he did screen printing. All those technologies really, really make images that are very binary. It's either a saturated image, you know, like either printed with color or white or not color, like the paper shows. And I think that this kind of direct process of seeing bold compositions that were done in this very kind of direct media affected my young mind. And I started to see shapes when I looked at anything. Now we talk a lot about composition and different ideas about splitting the picture frame and so forth. But I think back then I was, I was interested in just how what these shapes em emotionally meant to me, like well, how did they affect me? Did they seem strong or did they seem off balance? And so I developed an internally a kind of personal uh, vocabulary of shapes. And I just included this because it's such a cool photo. This is from the Durant Garage. I actually took this photo when I was 12. And this was used on my father's last uh, show exhibition at Keel Hall. And I just think it, I always picture him as an older, uh, person either as the young artist or as the kind of seasoned artist who's got his shit all together, you know, he's just living in his environment. Um, so here again you have this kind of cruciform uh, that's very common in my father's work and which actually was, uh, it, this is a sculpture by Paul Hapke uh, and this was a piece that I grew up around. This is like the fallen soldier, you know, this had to do with the Vietnam War, they had to do with you know, the artists who were trying to get a moratorium on the war. And I think that if you look in just in your mind, if you kind of remember these shapes, you'll see that these kind of big binary objects um, are, are what kind of, I, that really drove me. So 
this is a painting of mine that was done in about 1977 or 78. And uh, I had already met Jerry by that time. And so this is actually a, not a real collage. It's just painted to look like a collage. You know, they have Marlon Brando's eye and they have these kind of, you know, shapes. And I was just interested in composition. And I think even here now, it might be a stretch, but I think it's truthful that these shapes are very binary. It's very much like the, the, the war hero piece I showed you in the beginning of my father's. You know, this kind of modified cruciform and these kind of blocky compositional pieces with detail on top of them. Um, this is another one from exactly the same period. Again, the eagle is rendered with the airbrush and I was doing these false shadows and trying to make these things that were really technically difficult to, to, to manifest. This one was uh, a piece that I actually incorporated some very, these are real uh, tiles from the Dayton's bathrooms in the Dayton's department store where I was really a janitor. And so I had a love for that. And here I am as uh, kind of the completion of I found this uh, recently in a box of slides, but it's, I think it kind of, here's me at 19, right? And it kind of encapsulates everything I've been discussing. You know, here's the image, 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm still drawing on, this would have been 10 years after the fact. Um, Jerry Ott's t-shirt that was a silkscreen t-shirt my father had done when he was at St. Cloud State. And you have sexy girls uh, at the bottom and eagle claws with big nasty hooks and, and it's space and it's robots and it's monsters and it's stuff that I would continue to be inspired by. But at that time, it was seen as a little bit trite because, you know, it was hard to take that stuff too seriously. It seemed a little bit um, uh, masturbatory, which I suspect it was. But I had the technical idea. Um, I had the technical need to, to execute it, and it excited me. My work was uh, a, a, a something I found a lot of um, um, a joy in, you know, real joy. I just put this in because people always say, where did you work when you were a kid? This is the studio, uh, uh, my dad's printmaking studio in our basement. So having that studio was an awesome, awesome opportunity. Um, this is uh, after I left St. Cloud State. I went, back, I went back to school and attended Southern Methodist University in Dallas. Uh, just a quick note on Texas. Why did I end up in Texas? Because uh, I had some contacts there and I had done an internship there when I was 19. So I had some contacts to um, to reach out to to try to find some employment because the economy was quite quite awful in uh, 1982. So when people talk to me about their economy woes right now, you know these are cyclical things. But what I did was something I would recommend also if anyone's interested in um, kind of following my my kind of methodology for for moving forward with their career is, you know, when you know people in different places, if you know if you have family members in different states, if you have people that, in your family that work in different professions. You know, build a relationship and say, I'd like to talk to you about what, what opportunities I might have, you know, what, what's going on in your area and so forth. So I, I traveled to Texas and I attended uh, Southern Methodist University. And my, because the university was, uh, it, it was set up uh, in, in a way in the, in the 80s, there was a kind of a, uh, a period where I think the world of fine art didn't really know where, where its feet were. You know, it was a little bit of a dance of the confused. It wasn't really really easy to try to figure out the value of being an artist or the value of being a creative person. There was a, it was a weird period of time for me and, and uh, Southern Methodist University uh, ended up being an ultimate, uh, ultimately an awesome experience for me because I hated it so much that I quit painting completely. Um, I really was uh, conflicted by, I had gotten into the university based on the work that I had uh, submitted. Um, it was a very small master's program, it was only 11 students. And, um, and at the same time, the faculty was sort of very uh, retro. Uh, the, most of them had been uh, abstract expressionist painters, uh, were very interested in, um, you know, kind of traditional mark making. So they were pushing me to go and do these more traditional types of pieces. And so right here, you can kind of see I was going away from my high tech uh, image creation towards a more kind of uh, abstract expressionist sort of gutsy, artsy kind of mark making. Um, I kept a little bit of these uh, photo pieces, but more and more the work became less and less about these technological image making processes and more and more about kind of traditional materials. This is a kind of a portrait of my brother. Um, and I think you can sense a lot of agitation in this work because I wasn't really enjoying the, the ride. This is the angry dodo bird, you know, it's like super angry. Um, and at some point I, I got so I was just feeling lost. Uh, 
uh, as far as what it was that I was trying to create. And I, my inspiration kind of waned. Um, at the same time, I had this lifelong love of film. And I was always interested in eventually trying to make movies uh, in the early 70s and mid 70s. It really was difficult to do. The, even St. Cloud State had no film program. So at the time that I was agitated enough with fine art to say, you know, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do this, um, I, I decided to uh, reinvigorate my interest in film. And, and my disappointment uh, with what had happened to me in, in, at Southern Methodist University was that it allowed me to think of being a paid professional artist, who was somebody who was willing to put a dollar amount on the services that they would provide. That ran contrary to the, the, uh, my ideas about being a working, working artist from the 70s and, and early 80s. My idea about being a working artist was you did it for the love of the art, you did it in a kind of pure manner, you did it with no real expectation of you know, being recognized financially for it, that that was all right, you know, that you, had, you could be the starving artist and you could live in a loft and you could have a day job and then you could continue to work. And that's really how I kind of thought my life was going to work out. But once I was disillusioned to a point where I, I no longer was interested in being that kind of a person, that kind of a painter, um, I suddenly became very focused on getting paid to do design work and getting paid. And, and I would say that if you're interested in having a career like mine, and that's one of the things that you're interested in now, in this station in your life, get used to the idea of selling your work. Get used to the idea that you have a value, a monetary value, and that that value is a real thing, and you can manipulate that. You can make yourself more valuable to potential employers, and you can make yourself more valuable to the projects you're on, and you can make yourself more valuable to anything that you connect yourself to. But it was a big hurdle for me. So I wish I would have gotten to that point a little bit earlier. Um, when I finished school, and I finished my MFA and got the degree, and that made me feel like I hadn't wasted the time because it was a value to me to have it on my, on my resume, even though I don't know what it meant to me on a creative level, I, um, I, had, I had this goal. I, I started to think, well, I got to get to California, and I got to get a contact to the movie business. So I started to do what everyone hears about, which is networking. And I would go to anyone I knew, and I would say, do you know anybody who works in the movie business? And do you know anybody who has a contact to the movie business? And at that time, I met a guy who was uh, doing uh, video news footage for Entertainment Tonight. His name was Jim Ruddy. And he actually said, yeah, you know, I, I said, I hear you work for Entertainment Tonight. And he's like, who are you? And I'm like, oh, my name's Ty Ellingson, and I'm doing, this, doing these things, and I have these, here's some images I created. And he was impressed with the work. He said, yeah, I'm, I need a set design. You know, maybe you could design a set. And I didn't have any clue as to how to go about that. But the opportunity blossomed from my passion. You know, it blossomed from my interest in, and, and I was able to get him to give me this little shot at building a little set. And then that gave me my first kind of like justified paycheck as a working professional in the film business. Even though it was this little set for television, I was able to add that to my resume. And suddenly all the various things I had wanted to do, you know, with the fine art work and the degrees that I had and my portfolio and these different skills with the airbrush and model building and all this stuff started to make a little more sense. And shortly thereafter, uh, I was able to meet another individual who was doing some uh, investigation for Lucasfilm. At that time, George Lucas was interested in building these very elaborate, uh, uh, um, very high-tech, very high-scale uh, movie theaters where you could buy, you know, buy a beer and sit in the theater and watch and have food served. And there were going to be these uber super theaters. And um, there was a guy in Dallas who had actually built a theater similar to that, and so Lucasfilm had kind of contacted him, and we're asking him to kind of investigate how George might build some theaters like that. So I caught wind of that, and I got a hold of that guy like the next day, and I said, please, can you bring my portfolio out to, uh, to the people at, at George Lucas's company? And they said, they said, sure, you know, I'll be happy to. And so I pulled together this, like, my work and my resume, and I put it all together, and I made sense out of it for myself. I started to think about it as a complete package, like I was a complete person, that my, my background and my history and my degrees and my work all made sense. And it gave me something I was surprised to learn, which is a, a, very, a very different kind of confidence than I'd experienced before, because I'd accepted my role as a working professional who was not afraid of being paid and who was willing to take a risk at, on his own behalf, 
And they brought the portfolio out, and I was able to get an interview. And so I, I took my credit card, because I had no money. I bought an airline ticket, and I flew out to California. And I was able to convince them to give me a job. And then the following week, I got my truck and loaded my crap and moved out there. And you know, I don't say that because I think that's what everyone needs to do. Because you, know, you can make mistakes in the exact same way. You can end up in a world of crap, you know, being somewhere you don't want to be. But certainly what I think the story suggests is you have to be willing to take a personal risk and you have to be willing to accommodate your own dreams. You know, again, if you don't take your dreams seriously, if you don't take your inner voice, your inner muse, your personal experiences about what is passion, what it means to me, if you don't take those things seriously, no one will take them seriously. So when you start to have those feelings like, maybe I could get this done, maybe I could go do these things, then you owe it to yourself to really double down and say, yeah, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to get out there. So irony upon irony, I did a bunch of stuff there. And of course, it's a long story, and um, time is whizzing by. But um, I eventually uh, was asked to work on the re-release of the original Star Wars. Now, it's ironic beyond belief that I could be sitting in my parents' house reading Star Lord magazine where they talked about how the visual effects were made for Star Wars. And not only do I end up at the facility working for the director, but I'm working on the exact same movie. Like, I worked on Star Wars because they re-released it in a later date with new footage that I designed and made the creatures for and so forth. And I think, like, whose story is that? Like, who gets that story? <laughs> so when I see Star Wars now, I can go, oh, Joe Johnson, he was a huge influence on mine. Oh, it's George Lucas. And then I go, oh, God, there's my credit. What a weird, psychotic thing that is. <laughs> That's like too creepy. It's as creepy as my dad's photo showing up on Sunday in many ways. Um, so I think what I like about this image is this was the this was like the imperial sh you know shuttle, and I think you can see like it kind of looks like my earlier like my mad dodo bird drawing. You know, it kind of has the same loose quality. Everybody was drawing very you know kind of anal and tight in that way, and I was always trying to impress George with my capacity to be a free thinker. And George is a cool guy. I, I know oftentimes I, I underplay, you know, people are interested in like, well, what's this guy like or what's that guy like? And it always makes me a little nervous because, um, you know, they're directors and you try not to put them on a pedestal. But at that time, George hadn't started the new trilogy and, and he was very impressive to me and he really had great ideas. And he was the guy who created so much magic for me. So, you know, at least in the years that I was in contact with him, um, I really enjoyed the opportunity to work for him. It was, it was kind of mind boggling, like I said. One of the things that was added to the special edition was this floating droid. And um, I did a several studies of these things. And you know, George would talk about things in kind of quirky, like, eh, it looks like a face. You know? It's got like fins and it flaps. You know, that's it. You wouldn't really get anything too concrete, which is great if you're a designer. This is another version I did of the same floating thing. It was kind of like an, a, a mad dog you know, droid. But he, went, he ended up going with the other one. Um, if you ever get to see the special edition, there are these low rider motorcycle guys that fly these um, kind of like swoop bikes they're called. It's sort of like the, the flying motorbikes. And this is my version of like the rider. So this is like the, um, you know, the, the most Eisley equivalent of the Hell's Angels. They're not that intimidating really. But, and back then I was, these were done very traditionally. This is just a, a 11, and a, you know, done on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper with them. Um, ballpoint pen and magic marker and these these all these pieces are gone now because the materials were so fragile that they kind of obliterated um, this was a uh, robot that didn't get used in the film but I like a lot because we were just starting to play around with computer graphics at that time they had already done um, they had done um, well the abyss had been done and I think you know, it might have been after Jurassic. I guess it would have been 94, yeah. So the idea was that you could make a robot that actually had holes that showed through it, and you'd know there was no actor inside. You know, that was, this design was meant to highlight the fact that you couldn't put a man in a suit. And those were the kind of contemporary ideas. I like that he has smoke coming out of his head. And I thought he looked a little bit like Uniblab off the Jetsons. <laughs> there was also these creatures that George wanted to be running around. and. Uh, the, the most Eisley street creatures. And I really had a good, uh, fun time with this. And again, I, I was always trying to go in with my own take on things because I think the, the initial reaction with giving an assignment like this would be to kind of duplicate the stuff that Joe Johnson and Neil Rodas and the guys who worked on the first film would have done. But I wanted to make stuff that was, you know, my own. And, and I, was, 
I was trying to bring a little more kooky whimsy to it, you know, and, and I, I would try to make George like uncomfortable with the designs because he would quickly get that way. So he would just go, what is this? You know, and I'm like, he goes, I don't know, you know, what it is, you know, and I, I just say, but it has blue flippy wings, you know. And I, I, I don't know, you know. But this one, this is, and I show this one because I really think that this is an awful design. And I really don't like the rendering, but I love the fact that it's wearing a bell. <laughs> like, I, I was showing this to George, and he was like, he's like, ah, oh, I don't know. It, it looks a little like a bean. And, and I'm like, and he goes, I don't know. And I said, yeah, but George has got a bell. <laughs> and, he, and he really stopped and looked at it. And I could tell he was going, would a creature most nicely have a bell? I don't know, are these shepherds? Are they going to herd this thing? I mean, I don't know. So. Uh, you know, eventually, this is the, 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 the kind of sumo turkey monster that they didn't go over big either. This is what he eventually decided on, which was this kind of modified cow, you know, kind of a, a velociraptor cow. Um, he had dropped the ring in the nose, of course, which, which I think was right up there with the bell, but um, actually ended up in the, in the movie. And of course, in Jurassic, they had the brontosaurus, that whole scene where you first see the brontosaurus in the opening of the film, which is spectacular to this day. You know, they get out of the Jeep, and there it is up eating the tree and eating the leaves, and you're like, holy crap, you know, that's what it would have been like. Um, by the way, it's weird, because in the actual movie, the, in Jurassic, the dinosaur is a certain size. You know, it's like probably 40 feet tall or something. But when it reaches up to get the tree, Stephen wanted it to be super, impression, super impressive that it reached up way high. And so we like, we like it, because it was a computer generated image, you know, like we, we kept scaling it up until it's like a 75 foot tall dinosaur. You know, like the people are at the bottom, like little tiny things. Um, I just think that's funny. Um, but uh, this was kind of a, a riff on the whole idea of the brontosaurus. Uh, I like this one. Kind of has a, it's in my own, oh, my thing fell out. Hmm. See, I'm getting all excited because of Mos Eisley. It's still, see, that's me. At, I'm still 17. Just as excited by Mos Eisley. Um, now, uh, am I going to be super loud now and everyone's eardrums are going to bleed? Okay. Um, this would, again, this is what we finally used, which was sort of a, looks very much like a brontosaurus, you know, with a little, little hooky nose thing at the front. Um, now to digress from the actual show, which has to do with the kinds of notions of creativity that I've been hammering away at. Everyone likes the story, and I, I was able to do some frame grabs. Um, in Jurassic Park, there's this sequence where these um, Gallimimus, which are these kind of dinosaurs that look like an kind of like ostrich, are all in this herd, and they, they come running down this hill, and they all jump over this log and then the characters are hidden behind it. And what we were doing at the time, no one had done, really knew how dinosaurs moved. There was those old movies, you know, where they, they were, the Harryhausen movies where the T-Rex had the little hands and, and they do a lot of rah, you know, that, I'm gonna lock this up. I'm gonna ease back on that. Um, so, um, so we did a lot of like pretending like what dinosaurs would do. And one of the things that, that Dennis Murin proposed was, wouldn't it be great to like recreate the trees that are falling over and then have everyone pretend to be dinosaurs and run over these poles? And the idea was gonna be that, but by doing this and photographing it from the same angle, we might learn something about what, you know, like how people jockey for position or how they come over. So everyone is like in this pose, like the Gallimimus, and they're all running and then these were big, you know, these were big sewer tubes that we had built these racks so that they would, you know, be the same as this. And um, so we were going to do, we did the first take and everyone ran and they had all the dinosaur guys, the men, you know, like all of us who were working the movie jump over. And then, of course, here comes me because I have great mad skills as a physical specimen. <laughs> <laughs> I was so capable as being a, a Gallimimus that, of course, I came up to, the, to do my jump over the plastic log and completely lost my, uh, my jack action there. I was just doing kind of a weird flip. And one of the things that happened was that um, I take a tumble. Uh, and when Phil Tippett, who was the lead 
guy in charge of the sequence, the animator, saw this, they said, oh, you know what? Ty fell down. We should have one of the gallimimuses fall down. So if you watch the sequence, there's a gallimimus that comes over the log, takes a big header, and then he gets back up and shakes it off and runs off. Unfortunately, I didn't do the same thing. <laughs> I did the falling down part right, but when it came to the actual jumping up, I didn't do it. So um, I, actually, uh, I actually crushed the bone in my joint of my uh, elbow. And, uh, and my first big role with getting a credit on a major movie, I had to go to the emergency room. I had to have corrective surgery. And it turned into this awful, like, woozy trip on Vicodin that lasted for 30 days. And of course, I was, I was mortified that I was going to lose the ability to get a credit on the movie because everyone knew how amazing it was going to be. I love that. That's me. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it did affect the movie. And it, it, this is actually on the DVD. I never actually saw this footage until like a couple years later and they showed this documentary on the television that actually included it. And well, I used to have those old uh, answering machines that would say how many numbers, you know, like you had three phone calls or whatever. And I came home from work one day and there was like 22 calls on the machine. I'm like, oh God, you know. And everyone was like, dude, I saw you on TV, you fall, you break your arm. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> so, and all I can say on that story is uh, I'm really glad it was Jurassic, which I think is a really spectacular film and has aged pretty well. I'm glad it wasn't Casper the Friendly Ghost, which was another movie that I worked on, which sadly was not the same experience for me. I don't know, I wasn't, we, we, we couldn't reenact floating, so that we didn't have to do a lot of those tests. Um, in around 1995, I started to be a little restless because I had a really good run at ILM. I'd worked on um, Jurassic and the Star Wars pictures, and I'd done a couple other things. Uh, and um, I was thinking that I was really wanting to work more as a designer and not so much in visual effects. Um, at about the same time, uh, a friend of mine by the name of Matthew Robbins, who actually directed the movie Batteries Not Included and Dragon Slayer, um, he and I had become friends because I did some storyboards for him. And he called me up, and it was a weird call because he said, I met this Mexican director named Guillermo, and you're going to work with him. And, you know, it's kind of bold to just call up somebody and say, you're going to work with him. But um, I said, oh, cool, yeah, I'd love to meet him. And um, so about a month later, Guillermo, uh, who is the director of Pan's Labyrinth and uh, the Hellboy movies, uh, he came to ILM to screen his first film, which was called Kronos. It's a great little movie. Um, and he and I met, and sure enough, he, he had this idea that uh, maybe I would like to work with him on some of his pictures. And um, uh, at that time, he was working on this movie called Mimic. And it was about this creature that could imitate, it was an insect that had grown crazy huge because of these biological experiments that were done, uh, and it could m imitate a human being. And um, so he suggested that I leave ILM. And at the time, in 95, most everyone around uh, the company, when I started to talk that I was going to do this, just really thought I was crazy. They really thought, like, dude, you are like, you're like on top of the charts here. You're one of the, the, the main art directors for all the digital work. Um, you know, you've got the pedigree. You're, you should not do this. But my sense was that I really wanted to, to change it up. You know, my father had passed away. I'd been, at, I'd been at ILM for five years. I was feeling restless. And so, again, you know, I think I was doing the seven-year game, you know. How would I feel seven years from now if, if this opportunity had shown up? And I'd said, nah, I don't think so. So I, uh, I did the thing that was difficult, and I actually left the company uh, in kind of the, when George was just getting ready to do the new trilogy. And of course, I was right on the dock to, to work on that. And unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of the new trilogy, but I respect the work, and a lot of my friends did some outstanding stuff on those pictures. So the blow, you know, as far as like, I did worry, you know, very much after I had left that I was going to be really re remorseful that I hadn't um, been involved in that world that, that he was going to create. But, you know, I had my taste with having worked on the original picture, and I really felt like how much better could it be than that. So these are just my first sketches for the Mimic. I kind of included them because it was a transition point in my life. I was, kind of went back to working with pencil and, and doing these things, you know, kind of very quickly, much like anybody in the room would do in a sketchbook. I love to draw. I still draw all the time. I, I think computers are only an embellishment to the ability to draw and to think in, in whatever medium you choose. 
Uh, uh, certainly it's transferable skills with the Wacom pad, you know, the digital tablets and stuff. It's very easy to, to transfer the skills that you have as a, as an, as to draw on paper into the computer. And then I think that it also, one of the things that I think uh, people don't really always cognize about drawing or practicing or doing, doing work with a, a, a like an instrument or playing the piano or whatever is it changes you internally because it changes your inner workings because those skills are tactile in a way. So they're not just intellectual. They're not like about just perception, seeing something and then recreating it. It's about muscle memory. It's about your skills, the, the way you breathe, the way you think, the way you, the creative part of your brain that really doesn't follow the rules the same way is kind of, is kind of you know, transmitted out of your hands through your drawings. Um, I, was, I was funny because I was talking about the word practice, and I, I think I never liked the word practice because it's so much like preparatory. I like you know, forging the future. That's what I think about when I'm doing, learning a program. I'm not just practicing, you know, because that means like, eh, you know, someday maybe I'll use it. I'm like forging the future of what it is I can be doing on my capacities and those kinds of ideas. And I, I, um, I remember that um, I was a little bit mystified as everyone was when computers came on so fast, but uh, I strongly suggest that, that they're no more than a tool and maybe right, you know, at any given moment they're kind of the flavor of the month for this period or that period. Um, you know, it's, a, it's okay to, to dislike them, it's okay to have questions about them, but at the end of the day, they're never gonna go away. Uh, so you might as well find your own way to, to, to use them, you know. Oh, oh, God, Jesus. This thing is, it's like having a spider in your ear. But that, there we go. Um, I included these because it's a little bit of like, um, once I had left the visual effects world, I, I started doing more and more like props, you know, things for movies that were actual tangible. Um, and I will say there's a, as far as like what you get a kick out of in your life, it's something cool about drawing something and then seeing it as real you know, getting fully realized. Um, this was like Hellboy's gun, which is called the Samaritan. And this just shows kind of the steps that you go through. And uh, this would have been in like uh, 2002, maybe. So I just draw, you know, like, like you would in your sketchbook. And this, we use blue line pencils so that you can make copies and not have the blue line show up. And then you just, I was getting very anal at that time with like being very precise because these would go to the fabricators and then they would actually construct them. So this is sort of like the next level of detail where everything is really clearly delineated like a plan. And then I would add a uh, magic marker. This is gray tone marker. Um, and Ron Perlman who played Hellboy, he was around a lot. So I was able to cut one of these out of foam core and have them hold it. And if it needed to be a little bigger, I'd just Xerox another one and you know, blow it up. And, um, and, and, you know, I put, I put a, take a zeroid or a, take a Polaroid of him holding it and we could adjust for the size. These are just some nice renderings of uh, things that I did. This was for uh, Blade Trinity. This was like a, um, a kind of a, an armor that the Dracula character, who they called Drake, you know, he wasn't Dracula, he was Drake. <laughs> he, um, he had like this suit of armor that was like, you know, kind of a timeless thing that had been built all through time. So I did several renditions of that. This is what they ultimately used, you know, some kind of crazy monster armor. It did, it, 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 you know, my idea was that there was a lot of grif, you know, like graffiti and like magic incantations and stuff around it. This is another gun. I've never actually been somebody who fired weapons. I've never owned a gun. I've only shot a 22 and a shotgun, but I've done more damn guns. I mean, again, it gets back to the shape. If you think of my, my dad's, here's my dad's, uh, you know, Vietnam piece again, exactly the same kind of cruciform shape. You know, high contrast. Um, this is like a archery weapon. Now I included this because this is a hand-drawn uh, design, but you can see that I was using like templates and straight edges and I was really getting, so it, my drawings were so technically precise that it was starting to get painful. And it was about this time when uh, I started working in 3D. Um, this is a program called SketchUp, and you can get it for free on the internet. You just, it, it's owned by Google now. Now, when I started using it, it was an application that was being created for architects. A guy told me about it, and I had a background in doing architectural rendering and, and scale model building. And so I started to use this um, program because I thought the renders that, crea that it created looked a lot like my drawings. They were really very tight, and they all were grayscale. 
And um, I strongly recommend if, if you're interested in 3D and computers and so forth, if, you're, if you have an, an idea that you'd like to learn more, it's, you can go to just Google um, SketchUp, is one word, and you can get a free copy. And it's very powerful. I mean, I have a, a pro copy, which allows for me to do certain things with the file formatting, but you'd never need to do that. And I, uh, I, here's an example of how potent the tool becomes. Um, this is the, uh, 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 a design that I did on a sketchbook pad of, of a, 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 kind of a, a kind of a crazy harvesting truck. And this was done as a kind of a, an exploratory sketch for me. And then um, you can see that, you know, there it is. It's like that, there, that, there, you know? And I, it just saves. There it is, there it is. And, you know, I don't show these drawings to the director, but some of the directors like Guillermo, who I've worked a lot with, he can look at these and go, yeah, let's see it. Because he, he can see enough there to go, yeah, maybe it's longer, maybe the front wheel's a little bigger, a little smaller. So um, that kind of started my interest in working in 3D. Now, I had a little bit of experience in 3D back in Jurassic, but by this, this was around in 19, I mean, around 2005. And these tools just became very available and really, really easy to reuse. They, they're, they're very simple tools to operate. And you can see that then it just allows you to um, take your imagination and give it three-dimensional form. Now, the one thing that's really great about working in 3D is you never, get, you never are forced to go backward. Like in the old days, if you drew a, a vehicle and you wanted to change it, you'd more or less have to either cut out a piece and make a Xerox and then try to scab it on, you know, like the other change, or you'd have to like redraw the whole thing. But when, you, when you're working in 3D, you're getting every view all the time. So you can generate 360 degrees of view in any direction for every model that you construct. It's so potent. Um, this is just another one that's kind of a flying thing. Blister air, I don't know what that is. Um, this is a big harvesting vehicle. <clears throat> I'd done this on my own and this was part of my portfolio when I sent work over for Jim Cameron to review. Um, I'd met Jim when he was working on Terminator 2, uh, when he was doing the digital effects work there. An interesting story is Jim's always been a super pioneer when it comes to technology. And he embraces all the new technology because of all the things that I've kind of been touching on. He's very confident and he's very creative and he doesn't allow the, the technological components to bog him down too much. He kind of goes, what will it do for me and how can I make it work in a story? How can I do these things? And interestingly enough, that he had done The Abyss and if you've ever seen that movie, there's this amazing kind of water uh, appendage. The, the, they called it the pseudopod. And it comes out of the, this moon pool, this water arm, and it eventually turns into a head. And it's, it was done at ILM in, um, in, the early, in the early 90s. And Jim had the concept in his mind, but it really wasn't that important to the larger picture. So if you look at the abyss, that sequence could kind of been cut out because it really doesn't... It's not necessary for it to be there, but he had this idea. He went to ILM. He got the guys doing digital effects to try it, and it came out so spectacular that that's actually what he based the T-1000 on. The T-1000 is the chrome version of the Terminator that's in Terminator 2. And if you look at the way it rises up from the factory when it melts or the way that it has a face that you know, changes, you'll see it's very similar to um, you know, the, the, the water uh, pseudopod. Uh, the difference has been an inspiration to me, uh, both uh, much, much like Jerry Ott in a weird way because he's very much using uh, uh, the latest technologies in a very original way for himself, for his movies, for his stories. And um, I was uh, fortunate enough to meet him when he was working on Terminator 2. And I kind of was able to just professionally keep a little contact with him. And again, that's the other thing I would suggest if you're a student and you're interested in getting, like how do I move forward with my career? When you meet people, stay in contact with them. Be polite. You know, be congenial, but give them a phone call, send them a note, you know, don't let yourself get off their wavelength because oftentimes people will remember you at the, at the moment when you're, you know, when they need something. And if you're on their radar, they will go, oh yeah, that would be great. Why don't you send me an example of this or why don't you do that? Um, so I had been uh, trying to uh, keep in contact with Cameron and had run into him a few times professionally and whenever I saw him, I was saying, you know, hey, if you ever have any shows, I'm always going to be available and ready to come work for you. In 2002, I got a call to come work on a project he was developing called Battle Angel. I'm not sure, the, I'm not sure what the condition on that show is, but um, that led to conversations about Avatar, 
And um, that's uh, when I got the call to come in and do the vehicle design work. I think I'm going to go a few more minutes and then still leave a little bit of time for questions. But just to go quickly through this, it kind of, uh, this is the amp suit, which early in the picture's production was called the power suit. And an interesting aspect to this is that when you watch uh, Avatar, the human proportion to the Navi is the difference between six foot sketches. And they really, I had a much more complicated kind of view of things. And we started to head more and more towards this utilitarian uh, kind of design. And Jim's concept was that um, the military always designs things to be super, uh, super uh, modular and really indestructible as far as the environment goes. So whereas I was showing a lot of these details that I thought were kind of interesting and cool, he was like, you know, these are cool, but you wouldn't want to have holes where they're going to fill up with dirt or water's going to get inside. And, you know, they're pretty much going to cover everything up with housing. Uh, so eventually, we got close enough on the sketches. He said, let's just go into 3D, man. Let's just do the 3D stuff. So this is the very first version of the amp suit. And surprisingly, the, the midriff, the, everything from the waist down sort of stayed the same. But the, there was a, a lot of modifications in the arms and, and in the cockpit area because of various story needs that Jim was dealing with. Um, I think these are, are actually, looking back at them now, they're, they're, they have a little bit more of a cartoony quality. But um, you, whoops, you can see that there was a, an evolution uh, between each step where we were, and this was all going on over weeks. Uh, uh, so eventually we started to streamline it down, and, and then the cockpit changed into something that was more like a Apache attack helicopter. And eventually, we started to work on the, the, the way that the shoulders operated. And, and uh, it's, uh, I guess you know, people are always interested, like, well, where did you learn all this technical crap? It's the same place I learned about guns. You know, I didn't. I just, I, I just pay a lot of attention to reference materials. So when I watch a, um, a documentary on the, uh, you know, the Discovery Channel about tanks, I just let my, my, um, my, my, my brain sort of just absorb it as a shape exercise. Uh, getting back to my childhood, I just see it as shapes, and I try not to overthink, like, well, does that cog turn that wheel? I mean, how does that work? I just think in terms of, like, well, clearly there's a joint there, and the joint has simple shapes, and, and I, I mean, I don't mean, to, I don't mean to make it sound as simple as I'm presenting it, but oftentimes we get overcomplicated with our thinking about these things. I mean, they really are, there's just a few ways that machines operate. There's not, like, unless you're doing the T-1000 where it's a molten chrome, you know, it's going to be a rotating point or a circle or something. And this is a kind of a hybrid where I took the 3D image and drew inside with just a pen to kind of show how the telemetry suit would work. And then we had just this just kind of, I'm showing that the level of investigation was almost endless. I mean, we had, we had size requirements for the operator so that he could reach all the various controls. We had different ways that the cockpit needed to open. Initially, it was going to fold back, but then he wanted the guys to crawl in so that we had to go forward. There was modifications as much as this shows. Just We had this piece at the top with the arrow that was, uh, was kind of a detail that was just a flange. And then what ended up happening is they wanted this ammo belt to go over the back of the machine, and the, so the machine needed to be modified so that you know, there was a space there. And it's, it's just a very slow evolutionary process. Um, once the design was, was kind of finalized, I put these documents together, which we called the, the AMP suit Bible. And they basically broke out all the various elements uh, as far as where the rotation points were. This is the foot. You can see that the bottom is indicating where the various pieces were articulated. And I just would include some kind of a detail uh, from a, 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 an existing source as a hint for what the materials would look like. So that's a, that blue image is from the interior of like a, an Apache warthog which is a, I love Warthog, um, uh, you know, an attack vehicle. This was done by James Klein, who's an illustrator that worked on the show under my kind of, they had these, I was the general uh, in the marching orders. I reported to Jim, and then I had some people that were brought in under me later after the designs were approved. And this was just like a, a, a draw over to kind of come up with the ways that we might deal with the paint. And the idea of like nose cone art was at play, the girl in the bikini there. Um, then this, the next level of detailing was done by Weta in New Zealand. Weta is the visual effects company that did uh, the lion's share of the work for the movie. This is a, a guy that I named Aaron Beck, 
and he was able to take my 3D models, which were done in SketchUp, which you see in the background, and then he would propose the next level detailing in the foreground pieces. At this time, when these were being done, I was actually overseeing uh, the, the detailing of the flying vehicles and some of the land vehicles and some of the, the amp suits. So mostly I was just kind of um, giving, uh, giving instruction out through this network of designers. That's the way the whole movie business operates. If you think about it as an inverted tree, you've got the director on the top, and then he has his lieutenants that talk with him, and then they have their people. It just goes down like that. It's just like most corporations. Um, this is a detailing of how the wrist operated. This is the same kind of breakout of the arm. This is the breakout of the detailing for the shoulder. One thing interesting is that most robots, if you go back to Star Wars, they're always like, they're always like the dance of the, the, the nutcracker action guys, you know? <laughs> because they usually just have one rotator here at the shoulder. And in R2-D2 or C-3PO, you know, it was really difficult to build any mechanism to cover up his shoulder, so he just had to go like this all the time, you know. That's why the, those robot guys just do that, you know. I wanted to learn to do that robot thing because I you know, thought it would be really entertaining when, when I, like, I went to the doctor or something, I'd break into the robot. <laughs> but um, at any rate, uh, we had to, Jim wanted the shoulders to articulate and so we had to come up with this way for the, these various uh, you know, me mechanical joints that would allow for the shoulders to flex appropriately, but nothing could interpenetrate the cockpit. So it was, it was a long development phase for that as well. So finally, this is the, the final version that was sent out to the fabricators, in front and rear, and then this is the full-size prop that was built at Stan Winston's studio. And so to have that fidelity of what you've created go down the pipeline and actually show up with this kind of a prop, is, it's, it's pretty mind-boggling. It's like the most effect I've been able to bring from, <laughs> from being a designer to having stuff show up on screen. Um, it's just a beautifully constructed prop. It, it, just everything about it is gorgeous. And here it is in the film. Interestingly enough, this scene, they built this set so that there's this hydraulic lift that brings Jake up to talk to Korich inside of the amp suit. And Jim made a big point. He's such a master storyteller that he made a big point that when he's talking to Korich, Korich is trying to convince him to come over and, and kind of be a spy for his cause and saying, look, you're a soldier. You should work for me. And if you do, I'll take care of you. I'll get your legs back. And during that whole scene, Jake's rising up. And it's the first time in the film where he sees somebody eye to eye. And the character of Korich is actually elevating him in, in, the course of the, in the course of the sequence until finally it's man to man. Jim had a lot of ideas about this notion of where the machine ends and where the man begins. And so he's saying, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do what you've asked. Um, this is just a sequence of the amp suits attacking. This is the Thanatar attack, um, which I love because the dynamic of the fighting is so outrageous. And this is, this is probably the image I, I would close on because it, it kind of makes sense of two worlds. Um, Jim had always talked about this last battle between Jake and, and Quirch in the amp suit. And he always said that what he wanted was the canopy to be broken away because he wanted it to be personal. By the time the sequence is, in, it's, is folding up, uh, Quirch is grabbing a hold of Jake by the hair, by his tentacle or whatever that thing's called, and is actually confronting him face to face, man to man, like not as two species, but as two entities. And you have Jake, who has been in this container. His, his being is being teleported out from the container into this flesh and blood biological body. And in a way, he is an avatar. And Quaritch, his body is encased in this machine, which amplifies him, and he is an avatar. But when they see each other and when they're, they're down to the battle, it's eye to eye. And Jim says it's person to person. And then, of course, um, he's shot with the arrows, and so his death is a, a human death, a physical death. Um, these uh, these uh, next images, I just quickly are personal images from machines and things. I've kind of started to work, after all of my talking about being disillusioned with fine art and SMU, I'm kind of finally back to a place where I'm creating images for myself. Uh, I don't know whether or not they uh, represent art or not art or design or not design, but I'm getting a big kick out of them. Um, this is a piece that I just built from uh, just kind of a, as amusing, crazy robot. And uh, this is another one that is, this is a computer generated model that I built and, and put into a kind of a collage. So I've kind of come full circle on that stuff. Um, and this, I wanted to close with the idea of this piece is what I incorporated into this 
poster. You can see it in the background, uh, overlaid behind. And my hope was to just kind of make it all make sense in this kind of cyclical way. It could, it could be considered a little trite, I suppose, because the piece is so powerful about the Vietnam War to take a piece of entertainment and kind of superimpose it on top. But I think the, the themes of violence and the themes of, of, of man and technology in 2001 and where we exist and where we fall have always been in the mix. And so I just kind of you know, wanted to incorporate something on this personal level for this presentation here. So I hope some of that made sense. If anyone has any questions, somebody has a microphone. If nobody has any questions, we'll all go to the white horse. Questions? Anybody?